Oh, boy, this is going to be so much fun because we're ready. We're ready to start our journey of investigation about stocks. Exciting stocks, sexy stocks, risky stocks. <laughs> yeah, right. And we start with a quote by a famous humorist of the first part of the 20th century, Will Rogers. He's the person who said, there are no strangers, just friends I haven't met yet. And he also said, what else did he say? Oh, um, I don't belong to any organized political party. I'm a Democrat. <laughs> so he said, don't gamble, take all your savings and buy some good stock and hold it till it goes up. And if it don't go up, don't buy it. Very wise advice, right? Well, they had a lot to think about in the earlier part of the 20th century because they lived through the Great Depression, not just the Great Recession, the Great Depression, where the um, stock market index of the time, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is still around, went down 89% or 88.9 percent. Yeah, right, exactly. Now, if you have the book, much of what we describe is from stock market, the first chapter on stocks, the stock market, chapter five. But they go into far too much detail about things that are not really that important for the vast majority of us investors. So in my humble opinion, I have put together what I call introduction to stocks, just Stuff you gotta know, dear students, if you're gonna call yourself the investment guru for your friends and family. Cool? Okay. And it's a long journey, so you have a lot to, to study, mull over, review, listen, watch, take notes, flashcards, whatever. So let's get started. Slide number two. What are stocks? Well, as we learned in chapter one on, when we did our little overview of the investment universe, Stocks represent ownership. So it's a, it's not the best term, stocks. In fact, the real term is common stocks. But very few people actually say that unless they're trying to differentiate between common stocks and, say, preferred stocks, which we'll discuss much later on. And where did the term come from? Well, it started in the 1600s when the... Um, the new world was being explored and exploited. <laughs> and so these ventures needed uh, capital. Uh, they needed money. It's a fancy word for money, resources. And so folks would get together and pool their, their resources and create a corporation. And the shareholders were shareholders in common. Every, sh every one share you owned gave you one vote. And you and the other shareholders in common decided the course of the the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we're said, don't we're told we as brokers, you know, don't use the term stock. No, use the term company or corporation. Well, it means the same thing. You own a piece of the company. And so we sometimes call stocks equities, equity financing. You're an owner. Why are stocks so cool? Well, they enable investors to participate in the profits and growth generated by the business enterprise. But remember, some enterprises don't always work out well. So you can wind up losing your investment. But stockholders are limited liability owners. What does that mean? Well, when you take Business 120, Introduction to Business, you'll learn about the different structures of businesses. And when you invest in a corporation, you're only on the hook for how much you invest in. So say you bought one share at $100 and that company goes into bankruptcy and the debts are sky high. Well, they can't come after you and say you owe us more money. No. Now, this is different from a sole proprietorship or a partnership, and you'll learn about that in an in a introduction to business class. What do stockholders receive? Well, we are going to concentrate much of our discussion on dividends because dividends are cool. But you hear people talk more about capital gains. They want the stock to go up, capital appreciation. If the enterprise does well, if the business does well, if the corporation does well, the shares should go up in value. 
but as we described, they're very volatile. And contrary to what many believe and how many people behave, stocks are not simply millions upon millions of worthless pieces of paper. Well, now they're all electronic bits. There's no more paper that people trade to each other each day. They represent ownership in real businesses that are in business to make money and, according to our capitalist uh, system, are what we use to feed, clothe, and shelter ourselves. So exactly, <laughs> this is the system we have. And it's not perfect. In fact, it might be the absolute worst economic system ever devised, except for all the others. Mm. So we... It's what we have, and we're going to do our best to make it the best, realizing that we'll never achieve perfection, dear students. No human is perfect. No human system that we've created is perfect so far. And that's why the Constitution says to create a more perfect union. They don't say perfect. They say a more perfect you know, We're always striving to get there. Slide number three, historical performance. Over the long term of modern finance, and when we say modern finance, we mean 1920s, 1910s, and there's some, some historical reasons for that, but the, 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 the record goes back much further than that, but there's some reasons why we, we use the early part of the 20th century. The stock market has averaged around 10, 11%. But in any one year, it is unlikely that the return will be 10, 11%. <laughs> that return has varied from a high of 53.8% to a low of minus 43.4. And 2008, right, <clears throat> one of the worst. If you remember the frequency distribution from back in Chapter 1. And in any given year, there's about a 1 in 3 or 1 in 4 chance of a down market. Now, does it mean that one, two, three, down, one, two, three, up, down, one, down? No, it doesn't work that way. In fact, if you go from 1982 to 2000, the stock market went in, went in two directions, up and way up, and then had three years in a row, 2000, 2001, and 2002, when it fell. Every year was like water torture, exactly. Unlike 2008, which was kind of like, kind of like a bolt of lightning from the sky where it went down 40% within a matter of weeks. Slide number four. Here's this the graph that we, we showed you back in chapter one. Um, you see that over the long term, and this is very long term, 200 years or over 200 years of, of returns, the stock market's done pretty darn well. The biggest expansion of the global economy in the history of the world and if you owned equities, it wasn't a smooth ride, as it seems to be in this graph, but you have to remember that this is a logarithmic graph. What does that mean? It means that you don't understand it. You and I don't understand it. It means that, well, no, we can be, it can be explained to us. Instead of going one, two, three, arithmetic, it goes to ten. It goes one, ten, a hundred, one thousand, ten thousand. It goes up in increments of 10. And so it, what it's doing is it's turning an exponential graph into a straight line. But those little squiggles, those squiggles, they look small, but they ain't. <laughs> They're huge uh, because of the exponential, um, uh, uh, the logarithmic graph that we're dealing with. So you invested in stocks and did very, very well. You did invested in bonds, you did okay, but look at the difference. Indeed, that's what opportunity cost means, folks. And then you invested in short-term instruments, treasury bills, and did eh. But look at look at gold. You know, you'll hear people say, Why aren't you investing in gold? What's the matter with you? A, a senator, this is a senator. He, he's now his son's now taken over Rand Paul and Ron Paul and Rand Paul. They like to say, if you don't dig it up from the ground, it ain't wealth. They haven't taken Business 123, Introduction to Investment, yet, have they? Because they don't understand that gold, you know, it barely beats inflation over time. But it's true, if the world falls apart, if technologically-based civilization cracks, dissolves, and, and falls into a pool of tears, then sure, 
I hope you have a lot of gold, and I hope you're not in the northern hemisphere, because <laughs> the gold ain't going to do you any good when the the civilization falls apart. Maybe it might help you for a little bit, but think about it. Slide number five. Well, let's take a little bit more closer examination of what is happening with the stock market since modern times, 1920s, whatever. And so we see if we now take a look at 10-year rolling periods. That's what these are. We're looking at 10-year periods. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And what is that? We'll take a look at that in a couple of presentations. So relax. You hear about it every day. And you start right before the Great Depression. And it turns out if you held your money for 10 years, you actually lost money, right, in the Great Depression. Of course, you lost a lot of money, and it came back, and then you lost a lot of money, and it came back. But you, over the, if you held it and went to a deserted island and came back 10 years later, you would have lost. Not a whole lot, but you still would have lost. And now we're coming out of World War II, the Great Depression, and we have the go-go 50s and 1960s science, <laughs> the modern world. And everyone's a king because everyone is driving a motor car. And, and the suburbs and freeways and atomic energy. And the stock market moved in two directions, up and way up. And then you heard people say, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Yeah, it's too late to get in. <laughs> because stocks were way overvalued in the late 1960s, and then we had the 1970s. Now, what was going on in the 1970s that made the market so poor? Well, first of all, stocks had risen to a very high level, and, and valuations were stretched, as we often say, elongated. But we had much uh, civil turnover, a uh, civil turmoil, I'm sorry, tur turmoil, Civil rights movement, Vietnam, women's rights, gay rights. <laughs> um, and we had uh, uh, the uh, the first oil shock in 1973, and then the second one in 1979. Disco. Yeah, I know you. Many of you didn't live through it, so you don't believe me. But it was a tough time. And Watergate. And sure enough, we had a 10-year period where the stock market. Didn't lose money, but came pretty darn close. All those things affected. All those things were, were affecting the economy, certainly. But the biggest problem was the baby boom generation. You had this huge bulge of, of, uh, of demography. You have this huge bulge of people, the demographic, uh, um, we don't we don't have it on the screen or anything, but if you if you've ever taken a, a, a demographic studies, they have these um, demographic uh, graphs that show this huge bulge. Uh, someone talked about it uh, like a pig going through a python, where the GIs came back from the war and were and the and the, and, the, and the people were told you got to have as many babies as you can to to because we have to beat those ruskies. And if you had one, typically you had four, five, six kids. I was in a family of four children. And if you only had one or two children, there's probably something suspicious about that family, maybe communist sympathizers. And so what happens when these people grow up? They need shoes and they need cars and they need jobs and refrigerators and housing. And so it was a, it was a very difficult time for the economy and the stock market as we said, was overvalued. So you had a 10-year period when the market went down. And what did you hear people say? Oh, is it too late to get out? <laughs> when you hear people say that, right, it's too late to get out. And sure enough, we come out of that time, 1980s, 1990s, new technologies, uh, computers, software, globalization, telecommunications, internet, Blue skies, productivity gains, the sky's the limit, and the stock market went in two directions, up and way up. And in the year 2000, you had almost 20% returns over the last 10 years, and everybody said, ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Right, it's too late to get in. <laughs> and sure enough, bang, we had the internet bubble and then the housing bubble. Don't blame the Great Recession on the stock market. It wasn't the stock market's fault. 
It was the housing market and the bonds that were tied to the mortgages that were tied to the houses that were way overpriced. And sure enough, you had uh, rolling 10-year periods where you actually lost money. The Standard & Poor's Fund, I'm sorry, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost money. And what did you hear people say in 2008 and Ooh, is it too late to get out? <laughs> yeah, because sure enough, we are still standing. We're coming back. Now, look what's going on. Does that mean we're going to repeat the exact same kind of of um, uh, pattern? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's going to even out a little bit more and probably revert to the mean. You might hear people say that reversion to the mean of about 10%. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it'll do this exact same pattern and everybody will say, ooh, is it too late to get in? And when you hear that, what do you know to do? <laughs> right, exactly. And so th that's why Mr. Buffett, Warren Buffett, the very famed investor, says investing is simple. But it ain't easy, right? <laughs> you see these patterns. You see the history but and you think, no, nah, no, nah, it's not going to happen again. Or, yeah, it's going to happen again. And you don't know. You just don't know. You just have to be prepared for the emotional roller coaster that is investing in stocks. And if the world doesn't end and we're all well-fed, well-clothed, well-sheltered and have Internet access, um, the future looks pretty darn bright. If we don't blow ourselves up, die in our own ways, uh, Ebola, tsunami, meteorite, Disco returning. I'm optimistic about the next 10, 20, 30 years. I am. And I probably won't live that long. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I hope to. Because the technology coming down the pike is just astounding. And the young folks coming up are so talented. So I'm excited. Slide number six. Historical performance continued. Traditionally, close to half of the return from stocks was from reinvested dividends. Huh? Relax, we're going to discuss what dividends are. Dividends are very cool, and they are optional dis distributions of earnings to the shareholders. That's money in your pocket. Now, they don't send you a check anymore. It's all electronic. But stockholders used to expect 4 to 6% in dividends each year. That was as much or more than bonds in return in interest, since stocks were considered much riskier than bonds. So, you go from 1936 to 2008, and you get an average dividend yield of almost 4%, 3.8%. But then in the 1980s and 1990s, a few other times, 1960s, uh, and of course, in the late 20s, dividends fell to less than 2%. Many companies weren't even paying dividends. Everybody wanted capital gains. So if you look from 1997 to 2007, the S&P 500 only averaged 1.5%. And you'll hear people say various reasons. Dividends were taxed at a higher rate than capital gains. Yes, this is true, but not anymore. Dividend, people wanted the business to reinvest the earnings for growth instead of distributing it to the investors. We want growth. We want capital gains. We don't want boring old dividends. We want you to grow the company. Stocks were no longer considered riskier than bonds. There were some books that came out that were touting this idea that, look, over the long term, yes, we say that stocks are riskier than bonds, but look, 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 as long as we take a long-term perspective, which is something that's very difficult for people when they're losing 10, 20, 30, 40% of their money. And, of course, savings accounts were also paying less than 2%. So, hey... What's the difference? Right. The savings account is guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Is the dividend guaranteed? No. Next time that they declare dividends, they could just say, you know what? We're not going to pay you dividends. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly legitimate. Companies that pay dividends don't like to do that. Once they start paying a dividend, they want to keep paying that dividend. But there's nothing wrong with them saying, sorry, we're not going to pay it. And the last one, of course, people lost track of their senses and bid up the prices. There's some truth to that. <laughs> ooh, 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 is it too late to get in? Slide number seven. Here we see from 1960 the relationship of the yield on bonds. This is the 10-year 
treasury bond. And what is that treasury note? We'll discuss that later on. Bonds, you know, bonds are loans. This is a loan to the United States government that, yes, I don't care what anybody says, the United States government will pay its debts. And then here's the yield on stocks. And we see that in 1960, they were fairly close to one another. And then inflation with the baby boom generation started to take hold in the 70s. And we see the bond yield starting to rise and rise and rise. We see the Dividend yield spike, that was the uh, 1972 and 19, I'm sorry, 1973, 1974 bear market. Prices went down, so the dividend went up, and prices were pretty pitiful throughout the 70s. And so we see finally the 10 year hitting over 15%. Now, this is something that was done by uh, the former Ch Federal Reserve chairperson, Paul Volcker. He, in the late 70s, was tapped by then-President Jimmy Carter. Yes, we had a president named Jimmy, and he's still alive. And he went to Mr. Volcker and said, look, we got to do something about this inflation. And Mr. Volcker said, yes, we can do it, sir. We can do it, Mr. President, but it'll probably cost you your election in 1980. We're going to ratchet up short-term interest rates. Remember, the Federal Reserve Bank has... has um." as a, a jurisdiction over short-term rates, and they did. They knocked the uh, the prime rate, hit 22% or something, really outrageous. And, 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 of course, mortgages went up to 17%, and bond yields went up to 15%. And it it did break the back of, of the inflation. It also sent us through two recessions, 1980 and 1982. But sure enough, what do we see? We see bond yields falling, interest rates falling, the dividend on stocks falling. Why? Because people lost track of their senses and started bidding up the prices, uh, among the other um, uh, reasons we discussed on the previous slide. And now, the year 2000, the, the Internet bubble, the S&P 500 dividend yield hit 1%. And there were people saying, it's going to go to 0%. We all want capital gains. <laughs> is it too late to get in right? And so we see the dividend yield rising as stock prices fell. We still see the dividend falling. And sure enough, here's year 2008. Stock prices plummeted in the Great Recession. The dividend yield went up because the prices went down. And the yield on bonds fell. In fact, we saw the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond go below the, uh, the Standard & Poor's 500 dividend yield. And that's when people said, ooh, is it too late to get out? And the answer is, oh, yeah, now's the time to invest. When you see this happen, it's usually a good sign that either we're going to do very well in the stock market or the world's going to end. In this case, the world didn't end, and the stock market bounced back. And it happened again in 2012. And sure enough, that was another good time to invest because in 2013, the market went up 30% in one year. And then we're seeing it bouncing back and forth. And now in January of 2019, end of December 2018, we see that the, um, the, the yield on bonds is about a little over 2.5% and the dividend yield is still around 2%. So we're bouncing along this bottom. And now you hear people say that we have a bubble of everything. They call it the everything bubble. They think stocks are way too much. Bonds are way too much. Uh, real estate's way too much. Everything's going to crash. And you know what? They may be right. Well, we do know that someday there's going to be another bear market. There's going to be another downturn. And, and people are going to be yelling, ooh, is it too late to get out? And uh, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. It doesn't mean I'm right. It doesn't mean I'm wrong. You know, it could happen tomorrow. It could be before that you even hear this. It, the stock market could have crashed. But that's part of investing. And as we'll see, if we take a long-term perspective, don't get too greedy, relax, and the world doesn't end, we should do well over time. But there are no guarantees. I think I've told you that before. Yes, I did. Anyway, so slide number eight. The pendulum swings. The bear markets of 2000 to 2002 and then 2008 have changed investors' perception about dividends. We now see investors and companies focusing more and more attention on dividends. Many companies that never paid dividends in the past are doing so now. What are some examples? Well, um, for 
uh, several years, Microsoft. This is the you know, late late nineties, early two thousands. They were sitting on you know, sixty billion dollars of cash. I mean, how many more times can they rewrite Windows? And every time they do, they make it worse. How many more times can they rewrite Office? Office, and so they were just sitting all this cash, and people kept saying, well, "What are you going to do, Microsoft?" And Microsoft didn't want to say we're going to pay dividends because that would mean they're no longer, you know, growth hyper growth company. So they started paying dividends, and then so did Apple, and so you know, Google's now paying some dividends, not a whole lot. So these tech companies that are no longer growing exponentially, they're still growing, you know, but and they got tons of cash. They're now starting to pay out dividends because they are mature industries. And the tax law has changed dividends so that they are taxed roughly the same as capital gains. And this woman uh, was based, on, I think she's still alive, she's in La Jolla, her name is Geraldine Weiss, and she wrote a book called Dividends Don't Lie, and it's not the best book, but it's a great title and it's something I love to use. So we thank Ms. Weiss for this title profusely. Dividends Don't Lie, and you know what, she's right. All the material you look on the internet, all the numbers we see from the financial statements we're going to look at later on, they could all be lies. You ever hear of Enron? <laughs> but the one thing you know <laughs> that is not a lie is the dividend. Why? Because they sent you a check. Well, they don't do that anymore. They electronically transfer the money into your account. But you know they paid that dividend. And here's a quote that's attributed to John Rockefeller. We don't actually know if he said it or not. Probably didn't. But his, his neighbor said he said it. Do you know the only thing that gives me pleasure is to see my dividends coming in? I don't think he actually said it, but it's a great line, isn't it? Yeah, his neighbor said he said it. Slide number nine. So what are the pros and the cons of stock ownership? Well, as we said, you invest in a company you get to share in the rewards of that company. It has been the best financial investment over time. Now, the real estate people will jump up and down and scream and holler that they do better, and we'll talk about real estate later on. But as we said, they're risky, right? So they better give us better returns, or why bother? They're very liquid, easy to buy and sell, assuming you're buying real companies, not penny stock scams limited liability right we don't have to pay more than we what we invested and the one thing we don't really think of too much because we're in it for ourselves you know we want to make money is that there's an increased standard of living for everyone as we said this system is not perfect it might be the actual worst system ever devised except for all the others and so we'll do our best to make it perfect realizing we'll never get there but the one thing we really need to do, and, I, and you know, it's such a, it's such a, a conundrum. It is such, a, it's such a, a puzzle. At the same time, the global economy is doing well, and more and more people are, are coming out of poverty for the first time ever, having money in their pockets and access to clean water and, and, and healthy food and uh, things that we in the West take for granted. The inequality has risen dramatically dramatically so there's the there's the you know there's the uh, the, the the push me pull you <laughs> if you're a dr doolittle fan uh, there's the there's the conundrum so how do we increase the equality without throwing out the um, the in innovation and the, uh, the the motivation that capitalism has i don't know i don't have the answer um, i i try to teach people to create their balance sheet and create their net worth statement and their cash flow statement, their income statement, and budget accordingly and invest wisely and, and be wealthy. And that's the best I think I can do. If you've come up with something better, please do, because we need your help. Now, what are the cons? What are the, pro what are the problems? Well, as we said, they're risky. They're volatile, which is a popular, popular euphemism for, I lost a lot of money! So we have to learn how to deal with that. And we will do our best to show you that that volatility can be your friend. Especially if you're young, starting out, don't panic. When the markets fall, that's a good sign. What? Payana, what are you talking about? I don't want to. Yes, you do. Yes, you want the markets to fall. Why would I want the markets to fall? Why? Because then you get to buy shares at a lower price, right? 
when J.C. Penney's or or Macy's uh, lowers their price 40, 50 percent, what do people do? They run in the door, right? When the stock market lowers their price 50 percent, everybody runs out the door. Figure that one out. When J.C. Penney's or Macy's raises their prices 100 percent, yeah, people say, I'm not going in there. When the stock market raises their price 100 percent, yippee, <laughs> me some too. Is it too late to get in? Yeah. So we have to change our our um, attitude, and we'll do our best to uh, help you take a long-term perspective and not panic when things go bad, because they will. You, know, you never know when they're going to. And then, <coughs> hanky panky. Yeah, there are some companies, there are not many in the, you know, the, the ones that we're going to look at. There are not many bona fide, which is a fancy word of saying, yeah, these are real companies making real products and services for people. There are thousands of scam companies that are not real companies or just shams. And they, yeah, they would love to steal your money. So we'll see those two penny stocks. We'll discuss those later on. So slide number 10. Let's take a look at volatility. Here's the Standard & Poor's 500 for year 2018. Now, what's the standard? Right? We'll, come, we'll get back to. We'll come. We've already discussed it a little bit. It's the 500 largest companies traditionally based in the United States. And so you started out in the January of 2018. And I don't know if you remember, but that's when the bit uh, Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies just skyrocketed. Uh, you know, Bitcoin hit almost twenty thousand dollars, and the mark, the stock market, sort of followed suit and went up. You know. Seven, eight, nine percent in one month, and everybody said, "Ooh, ooh, ooh is it too late to get in? Quick, run in the door, quick!" And then it dropped ten percent, and so you jumped out just to see it about go back up about ten percent, and then you jumped in and saw it jump down again, and you said, "No more! I'm never going to put my money in those, those crooks. I don't trust those Wall Street crooks. It's all rigged. The government and and the and all the and all the deep staters and all the." The banksters, and excuse me, I just took a sip of water and almost drown myself. <coughs> and then you see it starting to rise, doing fairly okay. And and so it hits a peak here. <coughs> and you put your money in. And this time when it drops, oh no, I, I'm not going to be fooled. I'm going to leave it in there and it jumps back up and you say, great, see, I'm right. And it falls. You say, oh, no, no, I'm not going to be full. It jumped back up. I'm right. And then December 24th, Christmas Eve, 2018, it falls precipitously. And you say, thanks, Santa. <laughs> so you see, you you can't let the volatility fool you. You cannot try to time the market. You can't um, try to get in and get out. You'll get squashed. You're a little flea and there's a room full of elephants running around and you're just going to get destroyed. So what we hope you do is to take a long-term perspective and just ignore the volatility. Assuming you don't need the money, right? We said stocks are long-term investments. So if you need this money in uh, six months, a year, two years, even five years, eh, not the best place, the stock market. But if we're talking long term, 10, 20, 30 years, yeah, uh, I, you know, what can I say? Uh, it's been very, very good to me. But uh, no investment's perfect, and uh, certainly not stocks. So go back over, make sure you know the uh, material in this presentation. Check out the study guides. In our next presentation, we will concentrate now on the markets themselves, the stock, what are called exchanges, and where uh, stocks are bought and sold. Are you excited? Stocks, sexy, exciting, risky. See you in our next presentation, dear students.